Welcome back, guys. We are on the 24th session of 24 in a row in 24 hours, over 100 faculty. Uh, you guys hung in there, whoever did, or even dropped on and off. I actually hung in there. So um, I'm, I am actually very proud to uh, present this faculty because they've all been with the Parekh Family Foundation uh, to our work in India and have uh, been able to contribute and see firsthand the things that we've done. Um, I want to thank Stryker for sponsoring this session, and I'm going to hand it off to Mark Glazebrook, your moderator for this last session. Mark, it's all yours. Well, Celine, thank you so much. Thank you for having us tonight. First and foremost, you and your foundation has been an absolute blast and a real contributor to global orthopedics, especially in India, as you know. Thank you so much for all the tireless work you and your family do for this. So um, I'm really pleased here because I'm one of Judy's friends. Believe it or not, Judy will have me as a friend. And what you see on your screen now are Judy's friends. Now, let me just get into my slideshow here. Hang on a sec. So these are cases from COVID. I'm going to explain this in a minute. But first of all, I got to get myself a drink here. I got a friend pouring me a drink. There we go. He'll pour that up. And I'll get you guys into the uh, share screen here in a moment. I'm not very good at this. If you'll bear with me, I'll have it for you in a moment. And Judy, if you can give me the thumbs up, if it looks good, I'll know I'm good. Great, great. So here on the screen, you see these uh, characters. Now, this is a cast of six. We consider ourselves Judy's friends. And during COVID, we got together on a weekly basis to have a case. And we had a few COVID orthopedic cases, but we mostly had the cases you see here. So it was our uh, stress-relieving weekly chat to decompress through these bad COVID times, and I'm sure you've all been through it. And I hope you're like me and are optimistic and can see the light at the end of the tunnel. So tonight we thought, since we're the last uh, hour of this wonderful um, global presentation that Celine has put together, um, we're gonna do the cleansing beer. So I would invite you all to get your own case of beer and have a beer with us while we're doing this talk. So please take a minute and get a drink while we're getting ready to show you our first case. So the, um, before I get started, I'll introduce my friends, or I'll introduce Judy's friends. And of course, Judy is our ringmaster, Dr. Judy Baumhauer there. We've got Dr. Keith Wachner as, a we as well. My friend and foe and best buddy, Dr. Tim Daniels, and Dr. Sheldon Lynn, who really shared some wonderful stories because he was in the heart of COVID and early in the disease in New Jersey, he was really struggling with he with his colleagues to get this under control. So we consider Sheldon our COVID expert. He was definitely on the front lines, like I'm sure many of you were. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Judy um, <coughs> to go ahead and take uh, over the screen. Um, so grab a beer and Judy, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'll turn it over to you. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Mark. And um, you know, uh, you know, cheers, cheers to Celine, cheers to the Parec Foundation, uh, cheers to my buddies here that made us it helped me make it through COVID during these time frames. So I'm going to talk a little bit about midfoot blues. I do have some disclosures. They're listed here. They're also listed on the AOFAS and AAOS uh, websites. First, I'm going to talk about, you know, how did COVID change me? Well, I had an ample time in a year to put out 10 publications. Uh, I also probably gained five pounds. It might have been beer pounds, uh, but that really was to the positive, but I really think it's to the negative. We got a dog, uh, another dog. We had a dog, and she passed away, and we got a new dog, and she's awesome. What to do to my practice? Well, still, even at this day, I'm limited to seeing only six patients an hour in my clinic. It took over the year to be allowed to run my two rooms for the OR uh, as we bounced back and forth, so my efficiency certainly dropped. And the last thing I know that we all know that Zoom is not as good as being in person for sure. And I really look forward to the time when I can hop back to India and hop back to some of the annual meetings and uh, catch up with everyone. 
So this first case is a 70 year old woman with some uh, right midfoot pain with, uh, with walking and uh, no burning or neuritic symptoms. There's no surprises here. She's otherwise healthy. She's a non-smoker, has a elevated BMI, but don't they all, it seems like. Um, she tried the simple non-operative things, carbon footplates, non-steroidals, uh, topical Voltaren gel without any improvement. We did inject her with some cortisone. You know, great for eight weeks like they often do, and then the pain returned. So as you examine her, uh, you know, my classic, uh, after I determined she has good neurovascular function, is for her to point where it hurts. And of course, it was right smack dab in the midfoot, but she also says it radiates a bit, like they often say. Um, so the pain was in the region of the first, second, and third TMT joints. And when I would examine her and sort of shuck those joints, that would reproduce some of the pain. The most common spot, of course, is the second, but it does, it, it can uh, expand, if you will, to the first ray and the third ray. I also was careful to measure her range of motion and make sure that it wasn't um, that she was so tight in her gastroc that she was walking on her tiptoes. So her ankle motion was actually quite good. So here's some standing foot films. And, and you know, what you can see here is that um, she has significant uh, joint space loss involving the second and third TMT joints and some collapse as well as some naviculo uh, medial cuneiform uh, joint space loss and assist. Anybody see anything else that they want to comment on? No, she has the classic sclerosis, the cystic changes. She has midfoot arthritis. Yeah, midfoot arthritis, nothing fancy. Got so, some four foot adduction there too, Judy, which I see quite frequently in these this patient population. I'm sorry, Tim, what'd you say? I, I talked over. She has some four foot adduction. Mm -hmm. If you look at the TNCC joint, uh, that second metatarsal is adducted, which I find is more common in the mid tarsal arthritic patients than in the general population. That's just been my observation, non scientific. Tim, have yeah, you noticed that more in the patients where the arthritis is at the navicular cuneiform as opposed to the first MTC? Because that's something that I've noticed. Yeah, it's usually medial based, uh, Keith. You can see she's got degenerative changes at the medial cuneiform navicular joint, yeah. and then it's sort of trans transferred into the second and third TMT joints. Yeah, because that those are the ones that seem to have more varus. It's if it's at the first MTC, I haven't noticed it as much. But I, I agree with you on that. So as you look at these x-rays, you know, how do you decide if you're going to move to surgery since she's failed her non-operative measures and she wants some surgery? You know, how do you decide what you're going to do for this patient? So fusion is really the, the, the mainstay, Mark. Pick me, pick me. Yeah. On, <laughs> so after contemplation and having a little drink to think more precisely about this, the one thing I find very helpful, and I know not everyone has this, and Tim, I know you're rolling your eyes already because you know it's coming, is I love using the CT spec scan. As, as most of you know, the CT spec scan gives you that detailed anatomy of the bones, and also the spec scan is a bone scan. And when you overlap those, you get a wonderful picture. And as my professor told me once, it's easy you just operate where the light is, you know, operate where the light is on a bone scan. So Judy, what I use is a CT spec scan and I pick the joints that are most active. And I hope that there's only a couple here like the x-rays show. But what if you don't have it, Mark? You know what, Sheldon, that's a great, great idea. Hang on a sec, let me get some thought here. <laughs> what I think, Sheldon, what I think you should do is you should use the poor man CT spec scan and this is crazy for a Canadian to tell an American this, but the poor man CT spec scan is a bone scan and a CT scan. That's what you need to do. The bone scan with a good radiologist will tell you the joints to, to do. You know, one, one of the other things you can do, it goes back to what Judy was doing before, which is when you're doing these injections, um, just see which joints work best after the injections so you can you know the, the beauty of doing these under ultrasound is you can have your ultrasonographer inject the joints you think are suspect 
Um, and whether they're doing it with steroid or just with, with local anesthetic, if they do it under ultrasound and you know you're getting it to the spot you want, that gives you a pretty good idea. And then if you, you know, correlate that with a CT, sometimes you don't, you don't have the, the option of doing a CT spec because you'll never get a CT and a bone scan approved in a city like Philadelphia with insurance. You got to pick one. But if you pay attention to the injections while you're doing your conservative management, you'll have a pretty good idea of what's causing the pain. I was hoping someone would say that. Um, so I, I popped up this slide because uh, one of my residents from a million years ago did this with me. You know, if you inject the, the midfoot joints, and we did this in cadavers, it really, the dye spreads all over the place. So diagnostically, it doesn't really tell you uh, exactly where it's going to go. Maybe a little bit more helpful if, it, if we know that the medial cuneiform navicular articulation is symptomatic with an injection. That's one of the reasons injections work so well is you can just pop it in one place and, and, and really put it across and it, uh, just put fluid in and it'll dissipate across the entire row. Um, maybe not to four and five, but certainly one, two, and three. And uh, we, we published this a while ago, so I'm not sure exactly that that will give you all your answers, but it might help with that navicular um, medial cuneiform joint. I don't have a spec scan either. I wish I did. I, I'm going to go tell somebody I need it because the Canadians have it. Yeah. So, Judy, uh, Judy, do you know if she had a tight heel cord? No, she did not. Okay. She did not. Judy, I'm pretty sure. I mean, I think therapeutic injections are great, and I know they have a, a very valuable place in our, our area, but I'm pretty sure that Tim Daniels probably doesn't have the talent to find those individual joints. Uh, I wonder if we would have any advice for Tim that, that might help him along. Tim, maybe you should get a CT spec scan. I got one, Mark, but I don't use it. <laughs> <laughs> so so now we're, it's as clear as mud. Actually, I just used my physical exam. And the, I think the, the injection business is helpful to know that if you're injecting into a joint that the pain's gone, that at least you're in the joints that the problem is. Because, you know, the differential diagnosis can be you know, neuritic symptoms, it could be uh, radiating pain from somewhere else, and at least you got that covered for yourself. So let's just say, let's just hypothesize that we are going to, in fact, uh, fuse uh, the, you know, medial column, and uh, you know, the, 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 depending on how you do your columns, it, the, up to the third. So in leap four and five. So what approach are you going to use? And do you bone graft these? A small little joint. Do we need bone graft? Tim, you answer first before Mark jumps in. Well, I've I've actually um, listened to the guys at Duke and started using transverse incisions more often. But I wouldn't do it in this case because you've got the medial cuneiform navicular joint, and then you've got distally the um, TMT joints, second and third. So I do a midline longitudinal incision, and you can. You know, the third's a bit hard to get to, but you can get to it through a single uh, midline incision. Can I make my life easier? Because I'll do two and three through one dorsal incision based more right at the interval between two and three. And then I'll go through a medial incision to either if I'm doing first MTC or, or the medial navicular cuneiform. And I think that one is less stretching of the skin. So you're getting a little bit less problem with wound complications especially on that dorsal aspect. And I also think it's easier because you can preserve the nerve vascular bundle in that first web space. And it, you know, as it comes down with right over that interval between the first and second MTC joints. So you can leave that alone and not have to be messing around trying to move that from side to side if you're trying to go from the first to second. So I just feel like it's a safer place for me to be in. It's less stress. So I don't mind the two incisions. What about bone graft, Sheldon? Sheldon, you are the bone graft king. Well, clearly, biologics or healing of the bone is a, really a triumvirate, a triumvirate of the growth factors, the environment. So, for example, if they're impaired and diabetic, they'll have a negative effect. Number two is the amount of matrix. You know, clearly, the study done by D. Giovanni talks about how fill, the percent fill does matter. So you, you can't leave gaps, so you try to fill as much as you can. And finally, the stability. I mean, I've been using a very stable construct, one of these uh, uh, lag screws goes through a plate, and that was something that's patented by uh, you know Dr. Wapner, and there are several companies that sells that, 
And by having rigid fixation, that triumphant will allow this to heal the best for the patient. So I do try to put bone marrow, bone graft. I try to add biologics that maybe PDGF, and I try to use the best uh, mechanical construct or rigidity, the lag screw through the plate. Okay. So, so here it is. This is why Mark didn't have to speak uh, because I stole his uh, imaging slides showing a, a straight dorsal approach for one and two. And I do it the same way. I do it like this. And then I, you can see over to, towards your left-hand side that I put an uh, additional incision if I'm going to go for the lateral side of the third, sort of at the third. I like that construct. And um, I find that that skin bridge is good and I don't have to pull it as hard as Keith uh, talked about. You can extend that, um, that dorsal medial incision up to get your navicular cuneiform as you need to. And I put down here a resection of uh, four and five, just to remind us that, um, you know, fusion of four and five can be really problematic because uh, you need the mobile rays to accommodate to the ground. So um, just for, I know this group would, would back me up on that. Judy, before you advance that slide, yep. I, just, just, uh, I just want to compliment you on your surgical approach there. Nicely done, Judy. That's very good. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Cheers to you, buddy. So, so what kind of plates and screws? Sheldon alluded to, you know, one of the things that is important is compression. So compression is important. What what other screw and uh, plate construct do people like, um, and why? Does anybody just use screws? Anybody in the panel just use screws? Yes. I hate to say this, especially with Keith here, because um, Keith has worked on an, a fantastic device with a compression screw and a plate, and I have used that as well. But for the most part, up here in Canada, we can't afford all these extra plates and things. So uh, I do use two multi-use compression screws, um, uh, cross front to back, a, a medial approach to do that, or sorry, from the dorsum to do those fusions. Um, you know, Mark, you need smaller, to in the smaller you need to run out your, you need to run out your spec, spec CT so you can buy the plates. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Actually, I have one for sale. I spec more plates. <laughs> what about other plates and screw constructs? So, so really what the, the idea is that we need compression and we need stability. Um, those two things. Um, and... I'm not naming plates and screws, but I would say, is there any other properties that we should be keeping in mind here? All right, sounds good. Anybody have any tips? Any tips? Do you all pin it primarily, get some x-rays and then plate and screw it? Or what's the story? I think the one tip I would say is I think people, and the non-unions that I've revised that I've had sent in is, I think people underestimate just how deep those joints really are. And I've seen a lot of non-unions that you go back and you revise them and only the top third of the joint has been prepared and the bottom two thirds have not. So I think that's one of the things you have to think about. Honest to God, Keith did not see this, but he thinks like I do. So the depth is really important and you need to, you know, I learned that from Ted Hansen way back when. Um, it's deeper than you think. So remember that. Judy, I would also add that a, a good talk preoperatively about the risk of non-union. I think, I, I'm not sure about my colleagues here, but I have I struggle with midfoot fusion sometimes with non-unions. Um, it's probably higher rate than my ankle fusions. So I, I like to talk to the patient and make sure they're aware that, you know, there's probably a 10% chance they may get a non-union, five to 10 at least, depending on what literature you read. Judy, I'd like, yeah. like to add to second what Keith said. In addition to just doing a very superficial preparation on the dorsum, they'll dorsiflex the first or second metatarsal and they'll fix it. They don't recreate the anatomy of the lateral tailor first metatarsal angle. They don't, they dorsiflex it and they get this sort of like malunion in, in you know, when, when they try to do a midfoot fusion. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. very important. So you gotta yeah. plantar flex it and basically push and recreate the normal anatomy. Yeah. So, uh, you know, these laminar spreaders are very helpful. Uh, this I just pulled off of one of Jim Nunley's uh, images uh, demonstrating the laminar spreaders. If you don't have this, you should get that to our group here. 
So here I am, I'm, I've used one, two, and three. I used a compression uh, type plating device and um, I felt pretty good about it, except for I did not do that naviculocuneiform joint because I didn't feel as though her symptoms were there. Um, she went on to have a solid union. So I always questioned if I should have done that naviculomedial cuneiform joint. Should I do the one, two intercuneiform joints? Should I put those across that? Do we know how much load is put on the adjacent joints when we do fuse these? These are unknown things, um, as far as I know, anyway. And so post-op, my plan was eight weeks non-weight bearing. As soon as I got these really strong plates with compression, I've started to let them walk a little earlier in a cast and then some physical therapy. I'm trying to get through this to this one uh, image right here that shows you my outcomes because I'm really about transparency here. So this patient, when they came in, this image right here is when they went to the operating room. The, the red line is their physical function. Green line is their pain. And the blue line is their mood or depression symptoms. And you can see from when they came in to me and when I finished up with them at three years, they essentially got a little better function and had about the same level of pain. So the question is, did I blow it? Was it around that naviculopediaform joint that I should have been doing something? or is something else going on with them? It's a point of discussion. For this patient, they actually had contralateral midfoot arthritis that was driving their problems too. So that's why they came back for me to do the other side. Now, I just wanna say stay tuned because Tim and Mark and I are gonna talk about midfoot arthritis, the challenges, solutions, and unmet needs for a webinar on AOFAS. It's a shameless plug and I'm sorry about that. We, we see more coming. Maybe. And we've got a Just question from the crowd, Judy, if yeah. you mind. Um, somebody said that they've tried using double compression plates, and they said they f if they find it dorsiflexes the dorsal surface. So what are your thoughts on that? Um, I'll comment on it. I believe that it, number one is, is one of the errors is that they didn't denude the surfaces appropriately. Secondly, the um, when you position the toe, you want to hyperextend the first MTP joint so that it plantar flex the first ray, pin that, and then use your stabilizing device. And I, I, um, I haven't felt that that has been a problem when I've done it in that fashion, but that is a potential risk. The lag screw goes in first. Anybody else? Judy, I just, one quick question. You know, the only option we had for surgery here was fusion. Do you ever see a day when we might be able to maintain some of that mobility of the midfoot? And, and is it important, do you think? Well, I think we're trying to preserve all our joints. So hopefully that'll be time in the future. So uh, I think, uh, is it Tim that's up next? Tim is up next. I think in the interest of time, Tim, you're on. as much as I don't want to turn the screen over to Tim because he'll probably go for an, a whole hour himself, we'll give Tim his turn. Tim has got an exciting case for us, and I think it's right from COVID times. Tim, take it away, please. Tim, you're on mute right you're now. It's the easiest way to present a case. <laughs> Did, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> that was quick. <laughs> so we're supposed to talk about COVID, I guess. Uh, the Canadian experience, while it, it's been very similar to, to everybody else's, uh, several several things I've learned. Number one is I'm a surgeon. Um, it really, uh, you know, we were outside of the operating room for a good two months. And uh, getting back to the OR, I, I felt like I was whole again. I, uh, I guess um, it's going to be, uh, it, it just is part of who we are. Uh, secondly, I, I had some extra time, so I built, I'm built. i building two planes, two balsa wood planes, or I call them my COVID planes. And uh, thirdly, um, you know, from a societal perspective, I've uh, never witnessed uh, mass, uh, I would call depression, as I've witnessed uh, during this uh, very unfortunate episode. We've, we are, uh, the police force, I've got a few buddies in the police force, they tell me that domestic violence calls are triple what they were before the pandemic. So uh, my my fear is that we'll be uh, paying the price of this pandemic for years to come, but certainly we'll be grateful when it is over. 
And I too do miss uh, seeing each, each and every one of you in person. So my case is COVID related because this gentleman, uh, well, you'll find out uh, shortly, uh, it's not a long case, but it's an unusual one. This, this guy is, was a refugee. He's 59 years of age when he presented to me. Uh, as a child, he had septic arthritis of his left knee, which left him with a very stiff knee. I, I believe it auto-fused an extension and he had growth arrest. So he came to see a colleague of mine and in 2005, he had a intramedullary nail put in and his tibia was lengthened. Uh, during the lengthening process, he developed a drop foot. So they stopped the lengthening. Uh, the leg lengths were close, but not um, ideal. Uh, so he still has a leg length discrepancy of about three centimeters on the left side, as you can see from these x-rays. Now, during this uh, process, he gradually developed increasing arthritis of his left ankle, subtalar joint, and talonavicular joint, mid-tarso. He just had arthritis everywhere. So uh, he came to me actually in dire straits uh, with uh, inability to walk because of this symptomatic arthritis. The um, treatment options, this, before we go into that, uh, this is his CT scan and you can see that approximately half to three quarters of his Taylor body is missing. Uh, the Taylor body bone loss gets more dramatic as you get more medial on the CT scan. So I'd like to open this up to the panel and ask them what their treatment options are for this unfortunate gentleman. We really don't have a whole lot to work with. Um, and especially with that stiff leg, I mean, if you could figure out a way to somehow preserve motion, it would certainly be doing him a favor. But the only thing I could really think of would be something radical where you would essentially do a total talus with an ankle, you know, total ankle and a total talus. It's a big leap of faith, but outside of that, he's gonna be really stiff. Even if he um, has a drop foot, I still feel that motion would be beneficial. But I agree with you, Keith, that um, certainly with this degree of bone loss, you're looking at something quite unique, like a total talus. I wouldn't be confident in an ankle arthroplasty. Mark, what would you do in Halifax? Yeah, Tim, this is a tough one. And, you know, the, the, the somewhat easy answer, of course, I know you're going to hate this, but I would get a CT spec scan to help me decide which joints that I'm gonna deal with. But this is one that, that I think, you know, if somehow in, in, in your hands, probably not, but if somehow you could do a total ankle and then, you know, fuse the other symptomatic joints, this patient would have probably a much better outcome. But I think, you know, as it's already been suggested, this patient may be condemned to a pan tailor fusion, which I'm not sure they're gonna to be totally happy with, but certainly much better than the pain they're having now. So Mark, over the many years I've known you, I know that you say those things just to get me to react. So I'm not going to react. Tim, yes, can I ask Sheldon. A controversial topic. This reminds me of a patient I had treated who had a bad Taylor body fracture with ADN and total loss of Taylor body, and he wanted. And I echo what Keith says: if we can maintain his motion in view of his knee pathology, that would be ideal. And I just don't know what you can really anchor your total ankle in. And I don't know how great, uh, you know, a total Taylor prosthesis is going to do. Would there ever be a role for something as controversial like a Blair, a Blair arthrodesis, where you do the Taylor body excision, get rid of the arthritis, and then slide the anterior tibia into that Taylor neck? I think that would be a good adjunct. Um, I've done those. They work. Um you know, um, that or bone graft, but uh, you yeah, can see that the anterior tibia is quite sclerotic. So I have a feeling you, you would have trouble um, getting that, uh, that tibial dissection to, 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 first of all, to get it mobile, and secondly, to translate it distally. But I have done those and they do work, Sheldon. It, it, it would keep most, some motion of the, of the hind foot. And because you're really rocking through the, you know, the anterior and middle. I don't know, just a crazy thought. That, that's all. Thinking outside. You know, the only problem is the rest of his midfoot is, you know, show parts and list rank joints are so arthritic. And you're going to increase the stress there. I'm not sure you're going to get rid of the pain if you just do that. I think you may you know, just. I'll, I'll just say that I'll say the nasty, you know, BK 
because that is that is an option for this guy. And um, he has a fused knee, though, so you have to give some consideration for that. But they have those active ankles now that that will work. Um, those, that's, that is an option. Um, I think with Sheldon's, when he t says take it out, I think it'll shorten it too much. And I don't think a fusion on there and lock it up with all that midfoot stuff is, I think that's problematic. I think that um, even if you did something like a total tailless um, and some sort of resurfacing, and then with the idea that your backup plan is a BK, that wouldn't be a bad choice. Well, Celine, uh, you're online, aren't you? What, what's your uh, advice on total tailai? Maybe he's not. He might not exactly be online. So um, anyway, I went ahead and, uh, sorry, that's not what you want to see. Uh, I went ahead and, and fused him. Uh, these screws did back out a bit, but he's four months out and he's solid. Uh, he's actually a little bit plantar flex, which I thought was beneficial because of the leg length discrepancy. Um, he's ecstatic because he was in so much pain preoperatively. But the reason I'm presenting this case um, as, as part of the COVID hour is because he developed COVID while he was in hospital. I don't admit many of my patients, but this guy is grossly obese. I didn't mention that. Uh, and um, he's got sleep apnea and a few other comorbidities. So... I brought him in the hospital, and he actually developed COVID on the ward. He came in, he, he got tested before he came in. He was a negative test, and then he developed COVID. And he was adamant that um, somebody uh, got, came into his room and injected him with COVID while he was asleep. Oh, and, God. That's no, I'm not kidding you. He, to, the, to the point where he was... Um, ready to to uh, contact lawyers because he he was convinced that uh, we had um, injected COVID into him. But nonetheless, um, he was very grateful to have his pain gone. So he he must have forgiven me because he he backed off on that accusation. Uh, he fully recovered from the COVID, even though he was uh, grossly obese and 59 years of age. And um, yeah, so he's uh, he's well on his way to at least being more functional than what he was, but it's not a not a straightforward case. So if he's into that kind of conspiracy theory, he's going to move to the U.S. and join the Proud Boys. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Hey Tim, did you give any did you give any consideration to plating the front of this if he's a big guy and stuff? Yeah, he, it it uh, you know I I try to stay away with from plates. The other thing I wasn't uh, he's got venous stasis. His soft tissues were awful. So I, um, I didn't, I actually did this through a fairly uh, minimal approach and I just didn't want to expand the incision duty um, and uh, take a risk at his soft tissue and take him in. I think a, a blow knee amputation would have been uh, quite an experience. That nail goes all the way up to the proximal femur. So getting that nail out would probably be a feat in itself. Um, and uh, I don't know, maybe you could cut through the nail with the Midas Rex and do it that way. But or do a low, or do a low, you know, a low baloney. Go that blow. would be, wouldn't that be really low, Sheldon? Yeah, it would be low. It would almost right. be like a Symes. Yeah. Yep. Um, anyway, you know, bo bo bottom line is he, he wants to shake my hand every time he sees me, and I always put my hand up like, no, I can't shake your hand. So, um, so anyway, uh, that's my COVID case. So Sheldon, that's a good point. I mean, Tim can go pretty low, so I don't think it's impossible <laughs> here. Anyway, I, I just want to, before we move on to the next case, raise a glass. I think everyone who's out there, raise your glass to us. And thank you, Judy and Tim. Those were two great cases. Thank you. And I think next we're going to move on. And I think it is Keith, you're up next. Yeah. Keith, Keith has an extra interesting case for us. Uh, looks like a nightmare on Washington Square. So tell yeah. us about this nightmare, Keith. So you know, I figured this year kind of was a nightmare for a lot of us. Um, and when Mark asked me to do this, I sort of thought back, so, well, you know, what was what was probably the, the biggest nightmare case I can remember in my 35 years that would sort of fit this COVID year. So th this is actually, you'll recognize from some of the hardware, this is kind of an old case. Um, Dr. Parekh was actually my fellow during part of this case. 
So we, we could blame him, but I'm not going to. Uh, but this is a why I went back. This is uh, this was a really really nice woman who had rheumatoid arthritis, diabetic, one of the nicest ladies you want to meet. Never complains. Fell going up her stairs at home. Needed onset of pain and discomfort. Uh, these are my disclosures in the wrong place, but basically, you know, came in showing this minimally displaced fracture. Uh, just kind of, you can see all the arthritis down here in her midfoot. Uh, it showed parts in her subtalar joint. We talked to her about, well, do you want to fix it? And she's like, no, I, I really don't want surgery. It's too scary. You know, I'll just use the cast. And so I said, all right, well, if you know, we put you in a cast, you got to stay non-weight bearing and make sure you behave Keith, yourself. And hey, Keith, Keith, you? Yeah. The slide we're, we're just seeing your, we're not seeing the single view of your slides. We're seeing, the, you know, the uh, the thumbnail view. What's your really? slideshow? Slideshow. It's slideshow. That might work. Yeah, I did. Let me try and get it again. That's better. Things well, are changing. Still kick it one more time. Double click on your first slide. How's that? Nope. Nope. No, huh? Well, it was working before. Double yeah. click on your first slide. It's still a nightmare case. No, that's yeah. better. That's better. Is that that's better? better. Okay. Yeah, now hit your, hit your uh, presentation. Slide Here show. you go. Is that better? Uh, no. No, go yeah, back. It's doing the same thing. Just take no, just take it off the uh, full view yeah. there. Leave it at that. That'll probably work. All right, so we'll do that. So anyway, um, so she came back. Uh, this is where she was about five months later. Um, nothing was healing. Uh, she still having pain. She was still in a cast. Talked to her about different options. So, any suggestions from the uh, panel? So I'm thinking, Keith, uh, I missed how old she was. I was all... She's 50, 52. Uh, how old? 52. 52. So, so to me, you know, it's metaphyseal diaphyseal junction bone, which makes you wonder. And then I would probably get a DEXA scan myself. And then I would wonder about, uh, you know, how her bone healing is. Uh, she certainly is in lockdown in her subtalar and tail and navicular joints. So they're probably putting a big bone block stress along that that uh, tibia. So that might be the reason for the malunion, but those are all the things I think about. And, you know, at our place, we use the tail for people that don't make bones. So I'd be thinking that and fixing it. Yeah, just so to give you a little perspective, this is now in the year 2000, just to give you a little perspective. Yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah. So this is what she looks like. She didn't want surgery. This is what she looks like about three months later. And she's like, you know, whatever you do, you need to save my ankle motion. Nothing else moves below my ankle. You need to save my ankle motion. Sheldon, what would you want to do? Something wrong, because this is metaphyseal diaphyseal junction. And I don't see callus. Um, and she's a relatively young age. And this is a person who should get probably an endocrine workup. Because well, she's, she's diabetic and rheumatoid, both. Yeah, she has both. Because yeah. I'm going to say, um, and, and basically, uh, you know, what she needs is stability. That's what mm -hmm. she needs right now. Stability, and then you probably some type of grafting or something about augmentation for the defect after your stability is added. So I would probably plate her, plate, and then lots of bone graft, and maybe some type of bone stem, throw the kitchen sink and pray. All right, so that's what we did. Um, there at that time, there really were no specific foot and ankle plates because uh, this was the year 2000. These were just starting to come about. So we you know, went to the trauma set and tried to steal as many plates as we could and see how much we could move her over. Could not get her completely corrected, uh, but got her better than where she was from this position to this position. Um, plated her on both sides, ran a bunch of screws across both joints. Stuck all sorts of bone graft in there. Um, thought, okay, this is four months later. And was feeling a little bit optimistic that maybe she was, this is a weight-bearing film. Ankle looks pretty decent. And I thought we were kind of getting out of this. And unfortunately, 
Did you put her in a crow boot at this point or some type she of? She was in a, a mom. She was a mafia, a molded AFO. Sure. And here she is, uh, yeah. eight months out, and here comes the second wave. All right. And just when we thought we were getting out of it, you know, we were getting into that second wave. And here she is at 13 months, and she comes in not because of this leg, but because her other leg now hurts. Right. This is a bilateral. So now we're in the second wave. This is a bit of a nightmare. She's yeah. telling you something, Keith. What did you say, Tim? She's speaking to you. Yeah. <laughs> so what would you do now? So she's still not really wanting OR. She's now out at about 16 months, and she still wants us to, to, to spare that ankle, if at all possible. Um, she basically can't walk on her left side. She can walk on her right, so she wants her left side fixed, because at least she can stay in a cast or her brace and get around on the right. Keith, can I, can I get you to roll back just, just a couple of slides? I just want to make one point, and I don't... You know, I know this was a long time ago, and I know you would do it differently now, but that's the perfect x-ray right there. In that case, I mean, you, you, you did run three screws across the syndesmosis, and that was great. I would have tried to run the top two as well. I would have, you know, threw the whole kitchen sink at her, and don't get me wrong, you certainly did. You really fix it as rigid as you can, but I just think our audience should know, when you're dealing with these difficult cases, syndesmosis screws multiple is a good idea, and I know you tried that here. I would have ran as many as I could through. Yeah. So the, the nightmare kind of continued as we, we went along here. Um, at 16 months, and here she is, her left side is actually now worse than, than her right. Um, well, figured, well, we got bigger, better hardware now. This was, you know, try something stouter and see if we could make the left side a little bit better than the right side and try to learn from my mistakes rather than repeating my mistakes, which doesn't always work. Uh, but this was you know, where she was one month post-op. And we thought, okay, well, maybe we're, we're doing okay. And here we are you know, six months out, nine months out, and as history is repeating itself, yeah. we're now getting into our third wave. So would anybody- Did you, did you, uh, can, you can you go back? Did you cut, did you make some flat cuts? So that you had, um, you know, more contact or able, so, able yeah, to. Yeah. So basically, we tried to figure out, figure out the best way to make some cuts here to swing everything back over, um, yeah. and that actually. Was a good plan. Pardon me. That was a good plan. Trying to get it so that it was actually aligned, so that yep. it was straight down. Yeah. Keith, did they did they invent the, the tibial calcaneal nail yet? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> not yet <sighs> hard problem very hard problem so yeah. this just kind of goes back to show you i mean anybody recognize this plate and this tells you how old this was this was actually originally set up as a forearm plate believe it or not uh, yeah or a field goal plate right yeah yeah and this is what we were doing back then is you know sort of stealing stuff um so she went on to basically bilateral failures and Fortunately, at that time, the vaccine was just coming to market and being invented, and uh, that's what we did. We vaccinated her, and that so there was a light at the end of the tunnel. So as we're getting through the, uh, this reminded me so much of this year. I wanted to use it because we had the first wave, the second wave, and the third wave, and it wasn't until we got to the vaccine that we figured it a way out. That, that's excellent, Keith. That, that's a great case. And I love the way you set that up because I, I think we all would agree the tibial calcaneal nail is the, uh, the vaccine for these difficult hind foot problems. Um, yeah, anybody have any questions before we move on to Sheldon's case? Okay, I'll ask you all to raise your glass and uh, thank Keith for a nightmare on Washington Avenue. Thank you, she thank you, Keith. Uh, Sheldon, you're up. Okay. I think I'm gonna echo what Judy said. How did COVID change me besides the Zooms? We spent more time with the family, but it did change my practice style big time. And I'm gonna show you how. Um, and this is the, you know, the case that really made me think. 
because we all know that COVID has uh, Zoom calls have a lot of problems, you know, so many issues. This is a 64-year-old diabetic lady who presented to me on Christmas Day in our emergency room and uh, basically, you know, had a fracture dislocation. Um, the residents reduced it. And I thought this was very satisfactory. I was very happy. And then I just told them, please send this nice lady and I'll see her in the first office hours. And this is how my 2020 started on uh, January 2nd. She comes in with this x-ray and I, and I go, oh God, it's dislocated. Uh, no big deal. So I act like the resident. I reduced it again, PGY 35, reduced it. And then sadly, Tim, I hear a thunk in my office after I try to get an x-ray and this is what I see. What, I'm, what, I'm, what am I gonna do now, Tim? You're gonna do a retrograde nail. You're a smart man. I wish I, I, you were in my office hours at that time. So I basically looked at her medial skin and this is what I see here. Judy, this nice lady is in my office. She's dislocated now, documented three times and I see this medial skin and my office manager goes, oh my God, take her away to the hospital. Get her out of here. Thoughts? Sheldon, oh my God, take her out of the office and take her to the hospital. Something <laughs> 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 out. That looks yeah. terrible. Right. So what we did was we call the OR, call the OR before you leave and let them know you're coming. Yes. And we actually did that because the medial skin had died. So I thought, step one, let's put an X fix. And then we actually helped the plastic surgeon. We did this uh, free flap. And then subsequently, we took this nice lady. After 14 days, I did a perk fibular nail. What do you think, um, Dr. Glazebrook? Is this reasonable? Is this crazy? So Sheldon, how did you keep her reduced in the interim? She was in the X fix. You can see the bars. She's in the X fix. We put a free flap. I waited two weeks and then I did a perk fibular nail. You know, Sheldon, I like this. I like the way you're thinking. And I'm sure Alistair Younger's out there is watching this and he loves this. Um, this is this is a great device for the diabetic, but I'm thinking there's more to this story, and I'll leave it to you to tell us. Right. I think Tim sort of stole the thunder already, but he's right. I saw her at Keith one week in my office hours happy i'm like what a save i i am the man i thought for a while then two weeks second office hours i see him once a week i'm like whoa what just happened and she goes i don't know it was starting to move and then i see this as well so i sent her key straight to the hospital tim she's now covid positive we're in march of 2020 she's now covid positive she has is she blaming you, Sheldon? Is she blaming you? No, no. She caught it from her son at home. Okay. All right. But, but she has failed hardware. I got needle drainage, and she's COVID positive. How do you handle this? I mean, she's a diabetic, and she's so scared about meeting God. Any tricks? A lot of, a lot of venous stasis there. Yeah. Can I go back to your ex fix? Take everything out and try to stabilize it with that. Do Excellent. So I get this patient a plane ticket to Toronto and get Tim to take care of her. That's what I do with all my difficult cases. I know, Mark. <laughs> well, you know, I think that Keith has nailed it right on the head. I mean, we have to go back to the basics. She needs to be stabilized. All the hardware has got to come out, but she's COVID. And we know that diabetics have a high complication rate of soft tissue, impaired bone healing, Charcot. So what do we do with this? This is the major problem. And, and I was like, God, COVID. So I sat down with my anesthesia team and they were not happy, but they're like, let's do regional block. We did this under basically a popliteal fossa saphenous block only. So we're not spreading the COVID. We're not really propagating it in, in the air. And then we did a skinny wire X fix. I did the Simon pin that Jeffrey Johnson espoused during fellowship sliding a stymen pin up, and then IV antibiotics after we remove all the hardware. And here we are, regional anesthesia, removal of hardware, IV antibiotics, cultures grew up MRSA, sadly, and here's the X-Fix with the um, stymen pin just to hold it. And she actually survived the COVID, spent uh, about two weeks in the ICU, and came out, 
And now she goes, it still wobbles, but two months later, after IV antibiotics, the flap looks good. We went ahead and did a primary TTC, which Tim alluded to, we should have done maybe initially at day one um, after removal of X-Fix and Stein and Pin. So what I learned from this case was um, diabetic ankle fractures are very high risk. You might want to consider a primary TTC fusion, but also if you have a COVID patient, um, I've operated about 20 of them, and we've lost around 40%, sadly. Uh, maybe regional anesthesia is a better option. Um, so that's how I feel. Diabetics, high risk. We know they're high risk, and COVID just adds a twist. Any thoughts? You know, I think people tend to underestimate how much trouble they can get into with diabetics. And you know, it, it's not just ankle fractures, it's midfoot fractures, you can go down the line. And there's a lot of people walking around with baloney amputations because that initial fracture was treated just like any other patient and not treated like a diabetic, which is a class and unto itself. You know, Sheldon, I wanna tell you, I had a case just before Christmas, it was a diabetic that the ankle dislocated, it was clearly a charco. Uh, ankle it was a, like a pilon fracture with no trauma mm -hmm. and a high hemoglobin A1C. This patient was on our trauma wait list and they waited four days until I came up on the wait list and I got sucked into doing this case because no one else wanted to do it. It's a perfect foot and ankle case. Well, right. I hit the bullet and did a perfect IM nail and everything was looking great. The yes. guy did not heal the wound uh -oh. and I, I amped him on Wednesday this week. I am so sorry to hear that. It is high risk, without a doubt. Yeah. But so we have to be careful with these. Sure. We have time for your case now. Wait, Sheldon? Yes. Here's to you, bud. Here's, yeah. your, here's your toast to your COVID case. Yeah. Sure. Wanna, yeah, yes. One of the things before, before we leave this is just to give kudos to Judy, because Judy really pointed out how many of these patients are vitamin D deficient. And that's really one of the things that is a, it's a trap that so many patients, diabetic patients fall into. If we don't, you know, we'll pay attention to the hemoglobin A1C and look at their albumin and, and, but forget about their vitamin D. And I think we have to remember that. And that's really what Judy pointed out. Cheers to Judy. I mean, I agree. Absolutely. So that, that's, that's a great case, Sheldon. And again, I just want to re, I just want to tell everyone again, Sheldon was in the OR with multiple uh, COVID cases back in, I want to say, you know, May when we were all learning about COVID and Sheldon was there on the front lines when New Jersey was having trailers for the bodies in the back of the hospital. And Sheldon, good on you. I just want to raise a glass to Sheldon just because he did so much work. We like him. And because I'd like to have another drink. Cheers. Another drink. That's one more. And we actually had some of our Friday calls where we were sitting there drinking and Sheldon was in the OR trying to stick a straw inside of his six masks that he had over his face. Mm -hmm. Cheers well, to you, Sheldon. Just, the, the thing was, it wasn't just foot and ankle. Sheldon was rodding hips and taking yeah. calls. Yeah. He was, in the, he was in the trenches. Sheldon, you're the man. Well, Good job. I'm going to move this along. I'm going to share my screen for the last case and I'll make this really quick. But believe it or not... Believe it or not, and I know this is going to shock you, and this is how bad COVID was. COVID was so bad that I had a patient who I treated non-operatively that had a complication. Can you believe that? So this is my patient. Some of you might recognize him. And if you think he's really my patient, he's not. But this is a great video of the classic eccentric load of an Achilles tendon, and there was a rupture. Now, this patient who presented to me because of COVID, had a delay. Judy, can you see that video? Is it moving? Did it work? Yes. Okay. Yes. So this patient, I can this see patient had a delay. You might want to do your slideshow. You might, yeah. you might want to put your slideshow. Oh, you it, 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 it is. So this patient had a delay in presentation to me of nine weeks. And this patient complained of weak plantar flexion. They really didn't have a lot of pain. They had fatigue with walking and they had intermittent aching. So this is the classic problem with non-operative treatment. And because COVID is so bad and things are so dire, you guys are gonna hear me tonight, one time talk about the downside of non-operative treatment. And the downside of non-operative treatment is nicely displayed here. Now, 
when you look at this this test, you might think, wow, this is a ruptured test, right? Because you know there's a squeeze of the calf and there's no plantar flexion response. All right. So what do you think, Keith? Give me some help here. What's your options here for treatment? So if this guy is already basically over lengthened, and that's why he's getting a positive Thompson's test, because you can squeeze the muscle, but all you're doing is picking up the slack in the tendon. I think you have to go back and fix it surgically. Right. So, so Keith, and I, the reason I'm picking on you is because you're one of my good friends and I know you can take it, but you are the superstar when it comes to augmentation of the Achilles with the FHL. And so here's the question, and I ask this to everyone I can because I hate to admit it here on a, on a global audience, but I do do a lot of lengthening surgeries for Achilles non-operative treatment. I, you know, it's an acceptable complication rate compared to surgical treatment, but this is the problem with non-operative treatment if you don't do it well. So Keith, can we shorten this up and get away with that? Or do we have to go right to the FHL transfer? What's your thoughts? I think it depends on the quality of the tissue. You know, so I don't think you can have an, a, a, a rule that says, yeah, I absolutely have to do this. I mean, really, the, the FHL is, the reason we devised it was for compromised Achilles tendon tissue, not muscle. Excellent. If the muscle's Excellent. intact and the muscle's good, it's, you just need something that's going to connect that muscle to the bone. We did it for chronic tendinosis because that tissue was not healthy. So I figured it failed under normal physiologic load. I'm going to bring the FHL in. I'm going to decrease the load on the tendon as well. But if you have a healthy tissue, then you can, you know, you can shorten it using the native tissue. Keith, I love you even more. That is the answer I was hoping you'd give. And it wasn't prompted everyone who's watching this. I think, Keith, correct me if I'm wrong, is that FHL tendon, whether you take it from the forefoot, which I almost only do, or you take it from the heel, it's a tendon source to bridge the gap that you might create to reconstruct. I think that if you can shorten that tendon, if the tissue is healthy and you can reset the actual contraction length, you can rehab that muscle and get their strength back. So here's a movie of what we did. So if you look at this, this is the patient. Keith was exactly right. It wasn't a re-rupture. This is a patient who has a tendon intact, okay? Now, Let's go to the next slide. So this is the problem. You see, we open this tendon up and this tendon's healed. At nine weeks, believe it or not, without an operation, these tendons can heal. This is the zone of pathology in the red. So the way I do this, or at least I used to do this, and I published on this, this is an asymmetric Z lengthening where I take, I, I cut the tendon in a Z fashion and right. I maximize the resection of the, ten, of the disease part. To try to do exactly what you said, Keith, I try to avoid um, taking away good tendon and keeping and keeping removing the disease tendon. So we did that in this patient, and you can see we were able to recreate a positive plantar flexion response. How do you, how do you judge how much to shorten? That's always to me the bane of this procedure. Yeah, you know what, Sheldon, I don't have an answer for that. I use the MRI, and I must say. I talk to my patients. I'm probably got too many movies going on here, just a sec. I must say, I talk to my patients and I tell them that we're gonna try shortening this up, keep it nice and simple, not take your other tendon, and we're gonna try to preserve the option for down the road for strength if we need it. And, and Sheldon, I don't have a good answer for you. I do use the MRI to guide me. I will and say that you are better off over shortening than under shortening. Yes, because well, muscles can add sarcomeres and can lengthen. Well but said, they Keith. Can't take them away. Well mm -hmm. said, Keith. In my last 150 non-operative treatments, Achilles, which I've had in the last five years, 150 tendons, I've seen one or two people that were too tight. I've saw I've probably seen 10 that were overstretched. So I don't think I think you can stretch the tendon out much easier than you can shorten it. So here's the other thing, and I'm gonna close with this. I've evolved from this asymmetric Z lengthening to a very simple, and I'm, I'm publishing this now, a Y on V shortening. Because if you do the Y on V shortening, you can zone in on the area of pathology. Again, Sheldon, well said, we're not sure, 
but you can resect this area of pathology on your Y on V, and you can tie this all up and end up with a pretty good construct without compromising the tendon. So I guess my message is if you are treating things non-operatively and sometimes your non-operative physical therapy fails and you stretch it out, I think the rescue, and I think Keith endorse, endorses me here, is to try to shorten it, removing the pathology. If the pathology is too much and you need some tendon source, maybe go to the FHL transfer. Any questions about that from the panel? Uh, Mark Meyerson published uh, on uh, outcomes, and uh, I believe as long as you do them within three months of the rupture, there's no detrimental effect on their eventual outcome. Well, there you go. I'm shocked that Tim Daniels reading the literature. Way to go, Tim. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. I, I, Time to drink. That's all I'm going to say. Time to drink. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they, you have to do something very the golf course was the closed. Time. And Celine, if you're there, we'll certainly give you the last word. But before I go, I'd just like to say a, a word or two about COVID times and the cases we've had with these six people on the screen. These are six of my dear friends. And if it wasn't for you guys, COVID would have been a hell of a lot harder. And I know alcohol always helps us, but it really <laughs> is the friendship that's most important. And as we said in the beginning, the six of us got together every week or every other week and had a drink together and talked about cases. And I'm really hopeful that some of these cases we shared to you tonight, may, you may have gleaned something from them, but most importantly, friendship trumps any kind of a case. It's Saturday night in, here in Halifax, and I'll turn it back to Celine and I'll head to the uh, TV and watch Hockey Night in Canada like we all do in Halifax. <laughs> Cheers to Judy's friends, and thank Cheers. you all for Cheers. zooming in with us. Cheers. Cheers, Cheers. 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 And that was a perfect way to wrap up this 24 hour COVID one of a kind uh, um, marathon foot and ankle global town hall. Um, I think just with the response we got and the involvement we had from all the faculty, this may become uh, something that we do every year. So uh, don't be surprised if I ping you again for next year, but thanks everybody. And I do want to just give one formal shout out to the AV team. They were fantastic for 24 hours, keeping up uh, with everything. No glitches. Everything was seamless, and uh, that was that's that's not easy to do. So I appreciate that, and and thanks everybody. Have a great night, and again, uh, thanks for all the support. Thanks, Celine.